Amen. Okay. Um, I was thinking as Kathy was doing that beautiful dance, I had about four messages that <laughs> flew through my mind. And uh, I had about four messages that flew through my mind. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful. I, um, where can we go? Where can we go? Where God can't find us. Or we can't reach him. I say, you know, we try to isolate ourselves sometimes. And sometimes you just feel like crawling in a hole. Anybody know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just feel like crawling in a hole. Don't want to talk to nobody. Don't want to hear from anybody. You just want to. But there's not a place we can go. There's not a place we can run. I might run from y'all, but I can't run from God. I try to run from my problems, but I can't run from God. We try to run and hide and disappear, but we can't. Wherever we go, he's there with his love and kindness. And he's there with his grace. I, uh, as I said, I had, about, but, but I had a message said in my mind. Actually, I, I had changed it the other day, and after that dance, I'd like to change it to about three or four more different things, but I'm just going to go ahead and give you what God had given me to give this morning. Uh, I never thought in uh, dance ministry was something that was not even, you know, we're celebrating 20 years of, of, of being a congregation when we first started. That was not even a, even a thought. And when Kathy started coming, she shared with me her heart for that. What a blessing that's been. I know she's down changing now, but uh, what a blessing it's been to our fellowship. Amen. It's been a tremendous blessing. Thank you, Lord. I can uh, say this, and again, not going into, you know, all that, but I can remember the very first uh, Breath of Heaven Christmas program a few years back. Remember that? Uh, I remember that had been a particularly hard year for us and or for me, you know, just, and I remember coming to that, that uh, presentation and God was saying, look at your people worshiping me. You know, and, and sometimes we get so jaded and so hardened sometimes that we miss what's going on right before our very eyes. Uh, so I'm thankful. I'm thankful. The verse uh, I'm going to start with this morning, and we'll back up a little bit, is from James chapter 4. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read verse 6, and then we're going to back up. I... Uh, I was gonna I was gonna do a lesson on Yom Kippur this morning. Maybe we'll do that next week. Or in a couple weeks. I don't know. But verse six of James chapter four says, He gives more grace. He gives more grace. It's God's grace that will hunt us down and seek us when we try to hide from him, when we try to put ourselves in places where nobody can find us, his grace will look after us. And he's willing to pour his grace out upon us. But the question is, are we willing to receive it? Are we willing to receive it? A gift is only good if you receive it. Um... Next, uh, the 13th, October 13th, will be the 20th anniversary of the founding of, of this congregation. And uh, over these last 20 years, that's, been, that's over a third of my life. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm not that old yet, but I'm getting there. But through those 20 years, we've seen different 
things happen, and if you've been in churches for a, a long time, if you know about churches, churches change your personality, and people come and people go and so forth. We've had some folks who've been with us for a long time, and some have just been here for a while, and some have left, moved away, or maybe something happened and they got mad and they left, or whatever. And that happens in congregations all the time. And we've seen different uh, I don't, uh, personalities. You know, a church, a congregation has a personality. Every, if you go to, you know, I know some really great pastors and churches in town, and if you go to the different churches, they, they all, you know, they preach God's word. It's the same Holy Spirit, but different churches have different uh, personalities based on the people who are there. And uh, we've seen a lot of things happen. And I, and I get to thinking, it's almost like anybody here, and I'm talking to the men, I'm not talking to the women, because I know what the answer from the women would be. But any of you men, have you ever had a midlife crisis? Okay. Now all the women are going to put their hands up and say, yeah, man. I'm... Okay. But with men, it's not a physical thing. It's not, you know, it's not like a... With men, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, an emotional or a spiritual thing. And, and we begin to, to ask ourselves, men, and I, I don't know, myself, maybe, maybe you haven't had this, but... You know, you begin to look back on your life and you, you, as you get older and you realize you have less years in front of you than you have behind you unless you live to be like 120, okay. But, and you start to think, what, what mark have I made in this life? What legacy have I left? And I've thought about, you know, Allegheny Valley Church of God. 20 years, hopefully many more. I don't know how much longer I'll be around, but I hope that you know, that when I go, it, either the Lord takes me or God moves me somewhere. I'm not planning on that. I'm not, you know, there's, I don't have any health problems that I know of. That, that I should start counting the days now. But, and I don't have any desire or heart to move or leave anywhere. I'm pretty nestled, nestled, nestled here, you know, in my house, and this is where I am. But when, when the, the time for the next guy, I'm praying for the next guy, whoever it might be. Whenever it might be, because this isn't Pastor Carmen's church. This is a congregation of believers that have a purpose for being here. We have a reason for being here. I think sometimes churches can forget why God has us here. Now, we, we, we gather together on Sunday morning, Wednesday nights, and Sunday nights, and different times, and we fellowship. We assemble ourselves together as we should do. That's important. But ultimately, the importance of coming to a church, this or any other good church that preaches God's word, is to be equipped to take your faith out there. God wants to equip us and teach us to be able to share our faith with others. Not, not for the purpose of we get more people in here. Oh, that's okay. You know, it's okay. But for the purpose of getting more people in the kingdom. That's that's what they did. That's what Jesus told them to do. Go out into all the world. Preach the gospel. Teach them all the things I have taught you. Make disciples. Win the lost. And uh, I'm thinking about we're here in this building in, this, in the middle of New Kensington. And I tell folks when people say, where's your church? And I tell them, the next time you open, there's a shooting, open up the paper and the little map there, we're probably in that little square somewhere. <laughs> because it's not the best of neighborhoods. See, see, I think God has a reason for us being here. We've been praying for a long time for this. We didn't start out here, but this is where we ended up. And whether or not God has another place for us to go from this place, a bigger building or whatever, I don't know. But I know this much. While we're here, I believe our purpose is to have an effect here. And if we want to have an effect here, we need more grace. We need more grace. Because it's difficult to minister to people that in the natural, you don't like. <laughs> okay? Let's face it. You know, we, now, now we just live a, a couple blocks down. And 
we see things happen in front of our house, people come and going, and I, I'm sitting there, and in the natural, I see these people, and I say, I wish it'd go somewhere else. Because you know they're up to no good. I drive past here sometimes, and the kids will hang out on the steps. There'll be kids, well, kids, some of them a little older kids, some of them not kids. They'll be hanging out on the steps. And, and I'll come past, and... Uh, and they'll be gone, and I'll see, like, you know, they would roll in blunts. I'll see tobacco on the steps, and, you know, I know what they're doing. I'm not stupid. I know what they're doing there. See them hanging out in the alley and going down the alley. I know what's going on down the alley. I've been living here long enough. I know what's going on. And what I'd like to do is call 911 and say, get the cops up here and get these kids off my steps. But my spirit says, no. Hand them a track. Hand them, go out and talk to them. Have some way, maybe, you know, there are people that need to be saved. There are kids that need to hear the gospel. They haven't heard the gospel. Or if they have, they haven't listened. Or maybe they've rejected. But that's why we're here. It's a different world than it was 50 years ago. I was talking with, with Lynn a little bit before, we, uh, before church. And I was, I've been watching on TV the Dick Van Dyke Show. Ever watched the Dick Van Dyke Show? Uh, you know, I was like, they're showing it on TV land now. There's not too much else to watch. Things were sure different in 1961 than, than they are in 2011. They showed an episode. I'm going to get in God's word. I am. They, they showed an episode where, where uh, Laura had lied on her marriage license. You, anybody see that episode? And when they found out that Laura had lied, that maybe their marriage was illegal, Dick Van Dyke said, well, I'm going to have to sleep on the couch tonight. <laughs> Kids will watch that today and say, how come? Because <laughs> it's a different world now. It's a different world. It's a whole different setup. It's a different, those of us who are a little older, we need to familiarize ourselves if we're not already with the way things are right now. Because if you talk to them like you would have 20, 30 years ago, they're not going to listen. Okay, now. Let's look at God's word. We started in chapter 6 of verse, of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 6 of chapter 4. He gives more grace. Let's see what the more grace is for. Because I'm finding out after 20 years of pastoring, anywhere from three people to 80, coming, going. I'm finding out that we lose our focus and we lose our vision and we lose, we lose our reasoning why we're here. And we allow the enemy to come in and we give him rain to be able to help us to divide ourselves and to, and to complicate matters. And now, this is, this, is a, this is going to be a hard message. After, after such a beautiful dance, I thought maybe I should lighten the message up a little bit. But when, when you hear this, whenever, whenever people hear this kind of stuff, some of them will say, well, that's for so-and-so. Oh, yeah, pastor, preach it, man. So-and-so needs to hear that. Some of them will say, he's picking on me. I know he's just preaching that just because he wants to get me in. And some, of, some, some will change the channel about five minutes in. Okay. Over in chapter 3, look what he says. If you're not a believer, if you're not saved, this doesn't apply to you. Because James wrote this to the church. Do you know that they had the same problems back then that we have today? They didn't have the technology. They didn't have all the outside influences that we do today. But it's the same problems, and you know why? Because people were the same. They were the same back in 41 A.D. as they are in 2011 A.D. People were still people. The church would be a perfect place if they didn't have any people in it. It would be nice and peaceful and happy and <laughs> just be quiet, you know. But people have a tendency to need direction including this one, okay? Look what James writes. He's writing this to the church. My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If a man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. The first, what James says here in chapter 3 is, listen, don't, don't desire the office of a teacher or a preacher. Because... 
if you have that office, your words will be judged more harshly than if you don't. See, and now this is a truth. I'm going I'm to tell you this. Whether you're a, a preacher or a teacher, whether you're just a parent, or if you profess to know Jesus Christ, your words very often stand as monuments. When you say things, they, they, they tend to stand as a monument, whether it's good or whether it's bad. How many in here, and I've, I've asked this question before, can you remember, I, back in your, maybe back in your childhood, something that somebody said to you that broke your heart or that cut you? I can remember things when I was a kid, people had said to me, and I still rem I remember how I felt. I can also remember there were some people, fewer than the others, that, that would say good things to me. And I can remember them. They, they stand, even today in my life, they stand as like monuments, memorials, words. You never forget words. What he's telling us, what James is saying is, listen, if you're going to be a a leader or a teacher or a preacher or a parent or whatever, whatever place that God puts you in where you have influence over somebody else, you need to watch your words. Because the words you speak stand as monuments. And you know what? Once you speak it, and, and you might feel something, you've got to get that to the Lord and, and the blood, but when you speak it, it becomes... When it comes out, it becomes a monument. Now, we know, if you know the word, you know James chapter 3. This isn't a shouting chapter. You know, we're talking about the, the days of awe and self-examination. Yesterday was Yom Kippur. It was, the, it was the Day of Atonement. The time, the days leading up to the Day of Atonement were times of great self-searching. I hope and pray that we will search ourselves today. Please don't search anyone else. I have to search myself. I have to watch the words I speak. Listen to what he says. Behold... We put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. I know Sister Kathy knows horses. How, how, how heavy is a horse? Half a ton? 1,100 pounds. 1,100 pounds of a horse. Okay? Now, that whole big 1,100 pounds, it takes one little piece of metal and some reins that probably don't weigh a pound. And if that horse is trained and the person riding it knows what they're doing, they can steer that horse with just one little piece of metal, a bit in, in, in the mouth. Okay? He says, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also ships which are, uh, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor lists. The, 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 the rudder is relatively small. If you look at some of these big ocean liners, their rudder is probably as big as this building, but compared to the boat, they're relatively small. and just takes a small thing to, to, steer that, to steer that big ship. Even so, James says, the tongue is a little member. I don't know how much our tongue weighs, but probably just a fraction of what our weight is. Yet the things that we say, the words that we speak, can have such great effect on the lives of others. I've said this before, you know, you could walk into Sheets, and uh, you, you ever get on Sheets down here in New Can? Sometimes you've got to stand in a line. <laughs> They've got a line going all the way back to the, to the money machine back there, you know. And by the time you get up to the counter, your words can either make or break that, that, that woman's day. That person standing behind the, the cash register. You can make or break her day. You can either encourage her, you can start complaining. Just little words, just the tongue, just, just things that we say. It might be three or four words of encouragement, or three or four negative words. And you can make the big difference. Listen to what he says. He says, the tongue is a little member, it boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. You know, fire is a, something that can be used for good or can be used for evil. 
We use fire all the time. It heats our houses, it cooks food, and we use fire. It can also destroy. It, doesn't take a, it just takes a small spark to start a big forest fire. So just a couple little words. Listen to what he says. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I knew I wasn't going to get a whole lot of shouting this morning. That's all right. You may have changed channel already. That's okay, too. Because I know folks do that. It's okay. I've done it once or twice myself. All right. <clears throat> for every kind of beast, this is verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is un an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Oh, my. You can't tame your tongue without, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ we can do all things. Through Christ we can, we can uh, rein in these things that he's talking about. But on our own, see I found this out, see I got saved, I worked over Allegheny Ludlam for 33 years, okay? For 10 of those years, or 11 of those years, I wasn't saved. For the first 10 or 11, 12 years I was there, I wasn't saved. So I was, I was the mill guy, you know, I, was, I played right into the... I, if you ever, any of you ever worked in a steel mill or manufacturing, you know what that's like. And I, I, could, I could run with the best of them as far as saying things. When I got saved, I found the Lord convicting me about stuff I was saying. And we would sit down and see a lot of people think, you know, women gab and blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you what, men, they, women don't hold a candle to men sitting around a lunch table in a steel mill. I guarantee you that. And, and, we, and they'd be talking about one of the bosses. They'd start talking about one of the, one of the guys on the other shift, you know. And everybody would be, yeah, everybody be chiming in and putting in their two cents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd find myself saying, yeah, and I can remember it. And I'd be chiming in, and God would say, shut up. Because those words I was speaking became memorials. You know, if you're not saved, you can say anything you want to. And nobody really cares. But if you go around telling people you're a Christian, you've got to watch what you say. Because somewhere down the line, that thing is going to come back and bite you right in the nose. Listen to what he says. The tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Verse 9. Therewith, bless we God. Oh, hallelujah. Bless God. I love you, Lord. Even the Father. And therewith, curse we men. What he's saying is, what, you know, on Sunday morning we're blessing God. On Monday afternoon we're bad-mouthing somebody. He says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not. So to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brother, and bear olive berries, either a vine, fig? So can no fountain yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. See, this whole, this, what James is saying here is, we, we got... We have trouble experiencing God's anointing. We have trouble doing what God has called us to do. We have trouble realizing the purpose he has for us because we spend too much time in the flesh worrying about other people, talking about other people, instead of being humbled and hearing from him. He goes on and he says this. This wisdom descends not from above. I want to get back down to where we started. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Now this is reflected in what we say. Is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. I would challenge you, as I challenge myself, to measure and weigh my words. When I speak from behind a pulpit or when I speak one-on-one -on -one with somebody, to measure and weigh the words I say. 
because if, I, if they're going to be established as monuments, I want them to be a monument or memorial to peace and mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. That's what I want people to hear when they hear me speak. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. From whence come wars and fightings among you? How many people here have spent a lot of time in churches? Have you, you ever seen a church war? Now, it's one thing. It's bad enough when we start to wrestle against other congregations. That's bad enough. But sometimes it happens in the body. Church war. Man, there have been, there have been worship wars. <laughs> you know, we don't like that kind of music. We don't play that kind of music around here. You know, prayer wars, ministry wars, blah, 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 all kinds of, people start striving. Listen to what he says. From whence come wars and fighting? Why does it happen? It was happening in his day. The, the congregations in his day, they were experiencing the same thing. Paul dealt with it in his letters. He says, where do they, what, wars and fightings among you, where do they come from? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members. Okay, verse 2. You lust and you have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Why? You fight and war, yet you have not. The first reason you might not have is because you don't ask. The thing just about asking. If you say, you know, you really, there's something you really desire. Did you ever just ask God? You just ask God. And then, once you ask God, Ask the person that's responsible. For, but you ask God first. You know something, I've, what I learned? I, I've learned to ask God. When I, when I have to make a decision, I ask God. And you know, what, you know what? I expect him to answer me. Because he answers me. He'll answer me with somebody walking down the street that I stop and talk to. And he'll start, I won't even tell him what I'm thinking about. But he'll say stuff to answer my question. He might say, that's crazy. That's all right. That's what happens to me. If, I, if there's something, God, you want me to do this or do this, I'll ask and I'll expect him to give an answer. It might be a, a talk show host on the radio. I'll turn the radio on. He'll say something that will answer my question. I have nothing to do with what I was thinking about. But God answers if you ask. Sometimes we don't like the answer he gives us. But he always answers. You have not because you ask not. Or you ask and receive not. Why? Because you ask amiss. Your agenda is wrong. Your agenda is wrong. You know, I can ask God. Right now, and I had mentioned this before, we're praying about our van. Our van's sick. <laughs> our van's a little ill. The transmission is slipping a little bit. So there's a couple things I'm praying about doing to see, but I'm asking God, should we get it fixed, which is, you know, a lot of money, or should we go out and look for another van? So I'm, I'm asking God. I expect him to answer me. They say, that's just a minor thing. Well, it's not a minor thing. It's God's money. I don't want to throw God's money away. An old van is going to you know, break down again in six months. I want to know what God wants. And we got the money. It's not that we don't have it, but I want to know what to do with it. I expect God to answer that question. I expect to get a clear-cut answer from him. Because I asked. Now, if I, if I go to God and say, well, God, I'd like a new van because I want all the other preachers to see me driving a new van. <laughs> He's going to say, hitchhike. <laughs> Okay. Okay. He's not interested. He's not interested in, you know, I need a, we need a van because we pick people up. Okay? Now, listen to what he says. Verse 4. You adulterers are adulteresses. Well, James ain't pulling any punches. Know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is, is the enemy of God. Now, we're, we're getting to the root of the problem. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I think the problem is, we fall in love with the world. We fall in love with the world. We love the things of the world. I'm not talking about, you know, people that are unsaved. We, I think we all have friends that aren't saved. I'm not dealing with that. We have to be able to, you know, minister to those people that uh, minister the word to them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, you know, we, we love nature and the things in the world and, you know, going to the, going to the park or going to a waterfall. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. But we're talking about the world system, the things of the world. The, thing that the, world, the things that the world thinks are important. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. That's what, that's what John said. 
He said, that's enmity with God. That's against God. Here's the root of the problem. Here was the root of the problem in James' day. It's the root of the problem today. And will be the root of the problem in the church, in the body of Christ, in every congregation. We love the things of the world more than the things of God. Do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? In verse 6, and here's where we started, and here's where we're going to finish. But he gives more grace. Thank God for the grace of God. When we come to him and say, God, I've lost, I've lost my focus. God, I've lost my, I've lost my foundation. God, I've lost my original purpose. I've got caught up. I've, 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 I've left my first love. I've, I've compromised with the world. When we come to him, he has so much grace. He has so much more grace that he bestows upon us. I thank God. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin. Upon the cross. That grace that he has for us. He gives us more grace. Wherefore he says. Oh Lord write this. I, I pray this, this ought to be. This ought to be a course in every seminary. This one verse. God resists the proud. But gives grace. Unto the humble. He resists the proud. Have you ever known. Somebody that started out humble and ended up proud. Maybe not in ministry. Maybe on, on the job. Maybe started out humble, humble, humble. And years later, there's something. Something. Listen to what he says. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In verse 7, Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You reading with me? It doesn't say that, does it? There's something before that. What's that word, brother? Submit. Submit to God. See, we like that last part, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And we spend all our time trying to resist the devil, resist the devil, resist the devil. But submit yourself to God first. Then resist the devil. Because if you're not submitted to God, you could try to resist him all you want to, but he's going to be right there. Because if you're not submitted to God, you're submitted to him. Amen. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. It was the Baptist that said, I got to decrease that he might increase. All through God's word we're admonished in the New Testament as believers to die to ourselves and to live toward him. You see, 20 years in ministry, there have been times that I have humbled myself and there have been times I've allowed myself to fall in love with the things that break God's heart. And I can, I can, I can tell you, I, can, I, can, I know it's, it's tangible. When I start to stray from what God has called me, when I, when I, when I start to, to lose that, that idea of humility, everything starts to unravel. Everything starts to fall apart. And it doesn't, it's not like God is punishing me. He's trying to grab me and just like he did with Israel in the Old Testament. He's trying to, to take a hold of me and say, listen, it's time that you get your focus back. It's, he loves those he chastens. And I'm saying all that to say this, this morning, I'm saying all that to say this. 
my heart and my desire for Allegheny Valley Church of God is that we would be a building full of people who have humbled themselves in the sight of the Lord. You know, God has a purpose. He has a path. He has a thing for each and every one of us. It might not be standing up in front of a pulpit. It might be in your neighborhood. It might be in the laundromat. It might be at the grocery store, wherever it might be. But if you want God to use you, if you want God to bless you, if you want him to anoint you, if you want him to show up, then Lord, help us humble ourselves in your sight. Help us submit ourselves to your leadership, to your sovereignty, to your will. Help us say like Jesus said, not my will but thine be done. You see, I'm praying and say, God, use our, use our church, use our congregation to make a difference in this neighborhood. To make a difference with these kids going up and down the street. To make a difference. I, uh, Lord, that, that we could claim these streets for you. Not so we can get a church full of people and get a bunch of people in here. Ah, that would be great to do that. But so that we could see your righteousness reign in our city. That's what we need to see. And if we want to see that, we have to be humbled before God. As a congregation, as individuals. If you want to see your family saved. If you want to see that loved one you've been praying for, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Lift up his name. Let them see Christ in you instead of you and yourself. And it will make the difference. It will make the difference. I can't tell you how many folks I know, they go out to evangelize. And they talk about all the people they got saved today. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at myself and said, Lord, am I doing this because I want people to come up to me and say, good message, Pastor. Or am I really concerned about your word doing something for somebody? I've asked myself that question lots of times. I could go out and get me a job for 20 bucks an hour, turn on a lathe or run a mill machine. I did that for 30 years. But that's not what God's called me to do. He's called me to do what I'm doing. And I hope and pray that you all would grab a hold of this this morning. That you, it's between you and God. It's an individual thing. We talked about the tongue. But ultimately, it's, it's the heart. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Submit yourself to Him. Resist the devil. And He will flee from you. Is that what God's Word says? See, some of us, I know some of y'all have been having a hard time with the devil. Submit yourself unto God. Resist him. Resist him. That means to actively say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You can say that. If you're submitted to God, you can speak those words, and you know what? He has to listen. If you try to speak those words and you're not submitted to God, he'll just chuckle. He might step back a little bit. But he'll be back in. I can't tell you how many folks, and I'm, I'm closing. I don't want to ramble on. And people, they say, man, I got, I, I'm trying to beat this devil. I'm trying to beat the devil. The devil beat me up. I'm trying to beat the devil. They say they're trying to beat the devil. But they invite him in every day. They fellowship with him. They love his stuff. Listen, submit yourself. Unto the Lord. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Won't you stand with me as we close. I hope you all love me. I hope nobody's mad at me. That's okay. There's a song, there's a little chorus we sing. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord. And He shall lift you up. 
higher and higher and he shall lift you up humble thyself in the sight of the lord humble thyself in the sight of the lord and he will lift you up higher and higher and he will lift you up if i were to ask this question this morning how many are willing to truly submit and humble themselves to god this morning so you know you know the things that you've placed before him I know what my things, I know the things I've placed before him. You know the things you've placed before him. Are you willing to offer them? As we had our worship time, I just sensed that God was saying, you know what, bring it to the altar. Whatever it is, whatever you want to offer up to him this morning, bring it to the altar. That altar can be right where you're standing. Right where you're standing. Offer that to him this morning, whatever it is. You know what it is be the, lo the love of stuff, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Father, we offer them up to you this morning as we humble ourselves in your sight. Lord, and I pray, Father, that you would touch and, and just move upon each and every person in this place. You know, we, we're, we're going to close. We're going to close in prayer. But if you just want to come and pray, you can kneel at the front pew. We don't have an altar, unfortunately, but... You know, we, we're not in a hurry to leave here this morning. If, if you if just want to come and pray for a bit, that's all right. But Father, I want to pray this morning for all those who are standing here, for the ones who have heard your word. Some have turned it off. Some have projected it on somebody else. But for the ones who are standing here this morning saying, God, that word is touching my heart this morning. Father, I want to humble myself in your sight. I want to be able to speak words of blessing. I, want, I need more grace. Father, I want to be able to establish monuments of blessing and mercy and peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, my prayer is that each and every person in this place will have heard and understand what your word is saying to us this morning as we prepare to celebrate 20 years of ministry next weekend. Father, as we look forward to what you have for us, I believe you have a purpose. Father, there's blessing awaiting us. There's, there's ministry. Father, I believe there's a harvest awaiting us. Prepare our hearts to be laborers in the harvest as we humble ourselves in your sight. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord.